Today, we're creating realistic heat distortion in Blender. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of CGC Weekly. This week, we're gonna be creating realistic heat distortions in Blender. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with heat distortions, it's basically, you know, what happens when air gets really hot. It kind of distorts light and it gets all wavy. It's like in the desert or on hot roads or jet engines do it. It's cool stuff, trust me. Anyway, I've always wanted to know how to create that effect in Blender, so I put my mind to it and I figured it out. Let's go ahead and get started. This is a scene that I'm going to be working with. Basically, it's a Spitfire Mark 9E, um, which was actually created by Martin Sifrar uh, on Sketchfab. So basically, I just have this scene where it just pans down, and obviously this plane has just shut down as the propeller stops moving, but I don't see any sort of engine exhaust or heat coming out of these pipes here. And I'm just saying, adding that in would make this a lot more realistic. Especially when we open up cycles and see this, it looks really cool, but seeing that heat distortion coming out of these pipes, that would be absolutely sick. So anyway, let's go ahead and start by creating the material that we're going to be using for our heat distortion. I'm actually going to start by coming to a new layer here, and I'm gonna reset my cursor to the center because it's actually not in the center. And I'm just gonna add a plane. Our heat distortion is actually going to be done entirely on a plane, so it's nice and quick, nice and snappy, and it looks really good. So, I'm first going to come into our material settings. I'm going to click new material, and I'm going to call this material heat underscore distortion, or whatever you'd like to call it, doesn't really matter. I'm also going to rotate this up on its X axis by 90 degrees by typing RX and then 90 on the keyboard. That way we have a little bit more of a planar face here, uh, and we can look at the area behind it when we actually have the light going through it. Anyway, I'm gonna split my window here and open up the node editor in the left half. Get rid of that menu. And the first thing we're gonna do is get rid of this diffuse shader and add in a refraction shader. And we're gonna hook up the BSDF output to our surface output, material output. And if we switch into rendered mode over here, you can see that we have refraction going on. That's pretty neat, I guess. Not really all that neat, but it's exactly what we're looking for. So. The next thing we need to do is change this IOR to a value of one, and basically that means it's air or non-existent. Actually, it's technically not air, it's a vacuum, but anyway, that doesn't really matter. Basically, we have no refraction going on between the world and this plane, so everything looks pretty much identical through it. You will notice it is a little bit hazy though, and that's just because the color is not set to the max, it's only set to 0.8, so we'll max this color out so the R, G, and B values are all one, and now our plane is completely invisible. Great, so basically what we're going to be doing here is altering the IOR with a noise texture. So let's go ahead and add a noise texture in. I'll come to the textures tab and select noise texture, and I'll hook up the factor output into the IOR input. Just like that, you can see we kind of start to get these distortions, but we still have a harsh planar edge, and technically it's not as accurate as we would like it to be, as these are actually IORs that are less than one, which is theoretically impossible in you know most scenarios, especially when we're working with something like air. It is impossible, pretty much. Um, of course, somebody will probably prove me wrong on that. If you do, please do down in the comments. I'd love to read, I love that stuff. So anyway. Um, what we need to do is we need to make this noise texture work on a value that is greater than one, because in most scenarios, IOR will be greater than one. So in order to do this, we'll use some math nodes. Now a noise texture generates noise values between zero and one. So in order to move it between any number greater than one, all we need to do is add a math node, change the mode to add, which it's add by default, and add a value of one. So let me get rid of, oops, get rid of these things and just type in a value of one. So now, no matter what value we have, it is always going to be greater than one. One other thing we're going to do here is add another math node and change this to multiply. And basically what this multiply node allows us to do is tweak how strong we want our distortion to be. So if I wanted this distortion to be a little bit weaker, I'd change it to 0.1 and you'll notice that it's almost non-existent or 0.3 will give us a little bit of distortion, but not much. 0.5 will give us more all the way up to one, or we could even go up to like 10, in which case we have crazy distortion that is completely unrealistic. Anyway, I'm just gonna leave this value at one for now because one is a good base example for us. Perfect, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, organize these nodes just a little bit here, that way we can keep track of them. 
I'm actually going to name this multiply node by coming up here to the label. I'm just going to call this strength multiplier. Actually, we'll just call it strength mult. Um, and let's just keep thing, or to keep track of things mentally. All right, so one other issue that we're having right now is the fact that we have a plane that is distorting stuff, but it has a very hard edge. And when you look at these sort of heat distortions, they don't just cut off, they have a nice smooth gradient. So we need to create some sort of gradient in order to map this IOR difference onto. So in order to do that, we're going to use a gradient texture. So I'll come to the texture section here, add a gradient texture, and I'm actually just going to add a diffuse node for now. We'll hook up the gradient textures factor output into the color input of the diffuse shader and hook up the diffuse shader to the material output. As you can see right here, we just have a very basic gradient. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to change this to quadratic sphere. And this gives us a nice smooth gradient that we can then multiply with our current value up here to get a more realistic fall off for our refraction. Um, but the issue is that the circle here isn't centered in the plane. It's off in the corner. So this corner will have a sharp edge, this corner will have a sharp edge, but then everything else will be nice and smooth. So somehow we need to center this gradient. And in order to do that, it's actually pretty simple. First, we'll add a texture coordinate node, and then we'll add a, where is it, a vector math node over here, and we'll also add a combine XYZ node. We'll hook up the generated output into the top of our vector math node, the combine XYZ into the bottom input, we'll change the mode to subtract, and hook up the subtract output into the vector input of the gradient texture. Now, in our combine XYZ um, node down here, we can change the X, Y, and Z values to 0.5. And just like that, we get our sphere now centered, or our quadratic sphere fall off centered. Uh, so, our gradient, not fall off. So the only other thing we need to do here is add in a color ramp between the gradient texture and the diffuse node, and kind of make it so it falls off smoothly like that. I'm also going to change the blending mode to ease, that way we get a little bit of a smoother edge. We want a nice smooth edge while working with this, otherwise we'll have a little bit of a strange artifact that we don't really want to see. Alright, perfect. So now that we have all of these nodes combined to make our cool gradient here, I'm actually going to move them back a little bit, and I'm also going to move the refraction shader and the add shader forward. I'm going to duplicate the strength multiplication shader, and I'm going to use the color ramp output as the second input for this uh, node here. I'm also going to change this to, um, I don't know, we'll call it sphere mask, I guess. And basically we're utilizing this multiplication to multiply the values seen here with the existing values given by the noise texture. Now we can scooch things over a little bit and we can hook up the refraction shader once again. And just like that, you can see that we kind of have a spherical fall off. It's a little bit tricky to see here. So maybe if I change the detail and the scale up of our noise texture and bump the strength up to somewhere around say five. You can see that we kind of, wow that looks like a black hole actually. You can see that we get this effect in only very specific areas um, but it kind of falls off as it reaches the edges. This actually looks really cool. You could do all sorts of effects with this stuff. I never even thought about this. Anyway, once we have this in check, I'm going to drop the strength back down to one here. We need to animate this texture in some way, shape, or form. And in order to do that, all we're going to do is add a mapping node. So I'll come into input and select, where is it? No, never mind. Vector and select the mapping node. We'll hook up the vector output to our noise texture input, and then we'll just duplicate our texture coordinate node, or if you'd like to use the same texture coordinate node, you can. We'll just hook up the generated output here. Then, if we change the location values, we can animate the direction that the texture is moving in. So right now, if I'm changing the Y value down, you can see that the texture appears to move up as though it is being distorted upward by heat distortion. So, in this case, I actually want to keyframe values for this. So, I'm going to come back to frame one. I'm going to change, actually, I'm going to leave all of our location values at zero here. I'm going to add a keyframe just like that. And then I'm going to, uh, by the way, I pressed I to add a keyframe there. I should probably mention that. Then I'm going to scroll to the last frame in our timeline, which in my case is 160. And I'm just going to offset the 
texture just a little bit here. Maybe negative 1.25 would be a good value. I'm just going to press I again to add a keyframe here. And if we press play now, you can see that our animation runs. Now it does currently actually have spline smoothing applied to it, so you'll notice that at the beginning of our animation it kind of like gradients into speed, like it kind of accelerates and then it decelerates at the end. And ideally we don't want this because our heat distortion animation should be constant throughout. So in order to do that, we'll just really quick open up a graph editor here. We'll go to, um, we'll make sure our plane is selected, and then I can't see my plane. Oh, okay. So issue is you don't have to select the plane, you have to select the node, right? And now you can see we have our heat distortion shader node tree, and then we can see the XYZ location. All we need to do is just select everything by pressing A, considering there are no other keyframes that you have here. Select all the keyframes that affect this node, and then just press T, and select linear. And this will make the interpolation linear. That way we have a constant speed for our distortion here. It's looking pretty dang good right now. And keep in mind, this is actually rendering pretty well in real time because of how simple the scene is. I'm running this on a 1070, so it's not very intensive at all. All right, we can close out of our graph editor once we're done. And if you'd like, you can actually make these into a node group. I found that's effective if you want to like hang on to the node group for later use. Um, but that's up to you if you want to do that. Anyway, once we're here, all we need to do is drop this plane into position in our initial scene. So I'm going to kind of close the nose, node editor a little bit. I don't want to close it completely because we'll be coming back and editing things. But I'll just move this plane to our first layer here. And let me actually show our plane as well. And I'll go ahead and just position this into a position above or nearby these exhaust pipes. So just like that. I can place this and we can either use this noise distortion for the entire area here and you can see that it's a little bit laggier now but there is indeed some distortion going on right here. Um, you can either place it so that it's above all three or whatever you're using or in my case I'm actually going to split this up into three smaller segments like so and position them all accordingly. That way, we can have a variety of different things going on. And of course, we are going to see some repeating patterns. And you'll also notice that right now, it is a little bit strong. We look like we have black holes and portals going through our, um, whatchamacallit, our plane here. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually drop down the strength to somewhere around 0.1. But if you do find that it is very clearly evident that all three patterns are the same, you can actually just come back into the location settings, create a separate material for each of the three, and just tweak the location settings. But you can see, I guess it is kind of hard to see here, that we do have that heat distortion going on. And of course, we can do all sorts of other things with this. We can change the scale of it. Say I want it to be a little bit more squished. We could do that, that way our texture isn't so much distorted along the local y-axis. Um, we could implement all sorts of different things using this quick and easy heat distortion trick. So, using this exact project file, here is my final result of heat distortion. This effect is a really awesome effect and you can achieve some amazing results. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this tip and that you learned something new. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again soon.